Hello everyone, uh, my name is Maxime and I'm a PhD student in Michael Horser's lab in UCL as well. And uh, I've been using NeuroPixels probes for four years now over the course of my PhD. And I've been asked to tell you about the um, uh, way to combine NeuroPixels recordings that you've been hearing about over the last two days with, with optogenetics. These aren't particularly different from regular neuropixel recordings, but they have a few technicalities, in particular related to the fact that when you shine light on an electrode, you're going to trigger opto artifacts and you need to be aware of them and handle them properly. I, I heard that Andy was talking about that just before I, I, I arrived. So uh, I hope I won't repeat uh, myself too much with him, but that's mainly what we're going to talk about today. Um, so here is our setting. So you have your brand new NeuroPixels probe, you successfully targeted the brain region you're interested in, probably the cerebellum, and you're having a bunch of neurons around the vicinity of your shank from which you record. You fire up Spike GLX or Open EFIS, and this is what you get. You have uh, beautiful spikes, which are spanning several electrodes because of how densely packed electrodes are on your pixels um, uh, channels, on your pixels probes, and uh, you start facing the challenge that um, electrophysiologic electrophysiologists face first, which is that you realize that you are blind, you do not know which neurons you are recording from, and in many cases you would like to be able to tell if this neuron that you're seeing there, these nice spikes, correspond to a projection neuron in your region of interest or to a small interneuron. And uh, what you can do to help yourself is to um, look at the firing patterns of these neurons or the shape of their waveforms and compute features to try to tease apart groups, clusters of neurons that you're, that you're recording from. And this is what this paper has um, done in 2017 uh, from the Poulet Lab. You, it has plotted the width of the waveform, the x-axis against the amplitude of it on the y-axis. And you see that maybe there is a bit of clustering there, but really just like that, each point is a neuron and they seem to form a big blob, just a, a continuum rather than clusters. You have maybe two of them and they do a line here in the middle, but this might really, be, really well be three or even four clusters. And what you can do to be more confident in uh, the statements you make about groups of neurons corresponding to uh, given cell types is express channel rhodopsin in some of your cell types of interests and shine light on the brain and make some neurons respond to your optostimulus and not others. And then you can take these cells responding to the light and map them back onto this feeder space and in this paper, this is what they got. Uh, you see that uh, on the left, most of the cells responding to the light in blue are on the left-hand side of this um, uh, uh, diagonal. And three neurons in black uh, are on the other side. So they're then pretty confident that the neurons on the left correspond to the papabumin interneurons they're interested in. And then they carry on in the paper discussing their function uh, and in relation to the behavior. Uh, this strategy to be able to um, tell which neuron corresponds to which cell type is, has been coined by the Zedo lab in 2009, I believe, in this paper, and that is called optotagging. And that's only one of the many use cases of optogenetics. Uh, I'm going to stop talking about biology now. Uh, this is just an example use case. But generally speaking, whenever you want to go beyond correlational evidence in your science, you want to uh, tell that some neurons are causally involved in uh, some behavior or that two uh, sets of neurons are directly connected, you will need to use optogenetics. And your pixels are great to use uh, with uh, this technique because you can just sample many, many more neurons and find some uh, needles in haystacks, um, which is well, what my PhD project was really about. So uh, now I'm going to um, dive into the technicalities of these recordings and start with data acquisition. So um, obviously you need to bring light to your neurons of interest. And for that, you need to uh, have an optic fiber uh, together with your neuropixels probe. So we're going to talk about these um, hardware related questions first. Then we're going to talk about data processing. Uh, you heard about KiloSort and Phi and learned how to use them. Uh, they mainly do the magic, but still it's important to be aware of these opto artifacts and try to um, uh, actively handle them and take them into account to make sure that you're not misinterpreting your data. And finally, we're going to talk about data interpretation and how which packages you can use to um, uh, load and wrangle with your NeuroPixels data and then tell uh, which neurons are responsive or not to your opto stimulus. So let's start with data acquisition. Um, so you um, 
the first most obvious way to um, uh, bring light to your cells of interest is to use an optic fiber that you simply position above the craniotomy that you made um, uh, on your mouse. So here you see two, two neuropixels probes which are stick to each other. This is not a dual shank probe. These are two single um, shank probes stick to each other. And you have an optic fiber that, you sense, uh, that everyone knows about. Uh, it's positioned here close to it. And the interest of uh, this setting is that you have a lot of flexibility. You can position your LED as, as you want. If you want to add one more probe, you can uh, fit uh, your optic fiber more easily and you can essentially fit more things in your craniotomy. And also this has infinite reusability essentially. You can, uh, like these things break really, like it's really difficult to break them. If you wash them properly, you barely need to even change the tip of your optic fiber. And because it's above your craniotomy, there's no tissue damage. You're not actually entering the brain. It's less invasive than other strategies. But it has some, uh, disadvantages, mainly the fact that uh, flexibility comes at a cost, which is that uh, it's variable across experiments, the, depending on the way you position your electrode, um, your, your um, uh, optic fiber, sorry, and mainly the fact that the power quickly decays with depth. Uh, you will only be able to trigger neurons about half a millimeter deep, depending on the power that you use. Um, and uh, you know how much you sort of uh, squeeze your fiber on the brain, but generally speaking, if you're interested in you know deep layers or subcortical regions, even you can't use um, the, the strategy. So what you can do instead is use a tapered fiber and insert it in the brain. Uh, these are um, manufactured by Optogenics. That's why uh, where I get them at least. And what you can do is simply uh, glue them onto your neuropixels pro. You can see it there, and then in one go, you can insert your probe together with a tapered fiber in your brain and you bring the light all the way down the deep structures you're interested in. So that's why it's more interesting. But the, of course, it comes at a disadvantage, which is the fact that if you break it, you break the probe and the fiber together, and they're also quite expensive. So it adds, you know, a little bit of a, of a like it increases the price of your consumables that you use for your recordings. And of course, it also leads to more tissue damage. So these are quite big and rigid. So if there is too much drift, uh, you might slice the brain and damage more neurons. Uh, these, this setting is um, uh, like sort of, a, it could be much better if you're using optrodes. Uh, I'm not using these. I'm just putting them here because I know that in some remote future, NeuroPixels probes might have some LEDs on their shanks and you might be able to use them to directly stimulate um, neurons deep in the brain with a single apparatus. Uh, but be aware that uh, these uh, settings are ideal because they allow um, better spatial specificity of light delivery. And there's, not, there's no more tissue damage because you again have one shank going down and you don't have an extra big glass fiber on top of it. So that's about it for the hardware. Now, the most interesting bit of the talk is talking about pre-processing, how to uh, use Kilosot and Phi to spike through data, and mainly how before that to pre-process your raw data to make sure that you're not making mistakes. And these are the problems that you're dealing with. Uh, you see in blue here, the length of the um, opto simulation that uh, I'm applying, electrodes on the y-axis. And uh, you see that at the onset of the simulation, there's a negative artifact. And the offset of the simulation, there's a positive one. Uh, so you see an initial uh, uh, period in the artifact and then an, a slow oscillation that we're going to talk about in a moment. But you need to be aware of these and get rid of them. Uh, so the, sorry, in this case, yeah. the light is a square pulse. Yes. So you could have probably reduced this greatly by using something slightly more gradual, right? Yeah. So, uh, because so I'm going to talk about that in, in 10 seconds. Okay, but, yeah, yeah. But, but indeed, so it's here at the bottom of the slide. These artifacts are proportional to the first derivative of the light power with respect to time. So if you have a slow ramping um, onset of stimulation, you will massively decrease the size of the artifact. But you might not want to do it if you really care about the precise timing of your spikes. For instance, if you're doing opto tagging, that's why we're not doing it in our case. But you can probably find some 
some middle ground. This is something that uh, you need to play with uh, yourself. So this slide is about the physical basis of the artifacts um, induced by light and they uh, uh, are called the Becquerel or photovoltaic effect, not photoelectric effect or something else. And uh, you can see in this paper from Nature Protocols in 2010 that if you shine light on a metal electrode, you will trigger artifacts, but much less so on glass. And that's because this has something to do with the interaction between the photons of the light that's shining on your probe and metallic structure of your electrodes. And your petals probes uh, are really sensitive to these artifacts. And you can see an example of it on the left. Uh, the second um, epoch, I would say, of the uh, artifact is this ringing artifact that you see here after the onset. And that corresponds to, that is caused by high pass filtering. So here you have one of these uh, artifacts that's from another recording, so they look a bit different. Um, so this is the pure light induced artifact that you see here uh, on the y-axis. And once you apply high pass filter, you see that uh, you make bumps appear on either side of uh, the artifact. And this is because uh, this is digital filtering happening in both directions in the past and the future. So you make a bump appear after and before your artifact. And these are caused by um, the fact that if you have really steep cutoff frequencies, if you want to be really uh, accurate between the frequency that you filter in and out using a Butterworth filter, for instance, you're going to have these ringing artifacts. Uh, if you have fast voltage detections. And there's a reference here that you, that you can uh, go read if you're more interested in, in this problem. So these are what these artifacts correspond to. And now, what, why is it a problem? So the first risk is that you're going to have false positives in neurons answering, like responding to, to your optostimulus. Uh, here you see a PSTH on the left uh, hand side, which is zoomed in on the right hand side. The time scale is about one second on the left and 15 milliseconds on the right. And you see that you have extremely accurate responses to the um, uh, opto stimulation. This is a cluster which has been found by Kilosort in which apart from spikes happening right after the uh, artifact are perfectly acceptable spikes, which you might cluster as good if you're not being careful. So these things can happen. And be aware of it. And, of, and the second uh, risk is the fact that you're going to have false negatives. The artifact itself, uh, especially if it's saturating, this is a panel taken from the uh, paper published in, in Science recently for about NeuroPixels 2.0. Um, especially if you have saturation, you're going to mask some spikes and you're going to see a trough uh, at the onset and sometimes at the offset of the simulation, which is not real, which is due to the fact that the spikes are lost and not found by kilo So, uh, you know, uh, Maxime, there is a question from Zara that you might as well answer right away. Yeah. She, was, she didn't quite catch whether the data you showed up to now was obtained with NeuroPixels 1.0 or 2.0. It's obtained with NeuroPixels 1.0. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, and uh, so this is an example of false negative. Don't jump to conclusions thinking that your neuron is inhibited by your stimulus. Uh, you just lost spikes. And, uh, and usually what you do is you, like if such a thing happened, you would ignore what's happening at the onset of your, of your simulation. Uh, but apart from doing that, you can come up with uh, processing tricks allowing you to hopefully get rid of the artifact altogether and, um, and rescue your data. Not if you have saturation, but two point of probes, which are going to be published, which are going to be not published, but uh, commercialized at 2022, have a much uh, wider uh, voltage range and they don't saturate as easily as a 1.0. But the recording that I showed earlier here was a 1.0 recording which was not saturating. So really it depends on your specific uh, setup. Uh, just be aware of that. So what can we do to try to handle the artifacts? The first thing is median subtraction, also, also called uh, common average referencing or CAR in the um, uh, NeuroPixels community jargon. Uh, so this allows you to get rid of noise shared across channels. If uh, you have uh, some power supply uh, leading to 50 hertz noise and you have it on your probe, it's going to be correlated across every channel. And because no neuron is correlated across every channel, you can very easily subtract it off and you recover your data if it's not saturating, of course. Uh, then what you can do is filtering to get rid of very high or very low frequency noise. 
which is not within the realm of what spike would look like. And you can do spatial whitening, uh, also called spatial filtering sometimes, which uh, allows to, just like the median subtraction, but in a, in a different conceptual way, allows to get rid of noise shared across channels. This is doing so by actively decorrelating the signal across electrodes. And this is exactly what KiloSort does for you. So uh, in most use cases, you can just run KiloSort. And if you want to read more about the pre-processing that KiloSort does for you, you should go there uh, on, on GitHub. And you see that it does common average referencing, bandpass filtering, and channel whitening locally using the 32 closed channels on, on your electrode. But sometimes it doesn't suffice, and you need to actively subtract the artifacts beforehand. And that's what we're going to talk about now. What you need to ask yourself is, what is your artifact like? You need to go look at it and see whether it looks like that. So this, this is fake data. I just drew it uh, by hand. Uh, if it's really homogeneous across channels, for instance, if you do white field imaging or if you do uh, fiber or photo simulation in another brain region quite far from the probe, the light which is going to reach your electrode is going to be scattered quite the same across channels, and then your signal is going to look the same uh, across the depth of the new pixel shank. But in some other use cases, like the one I showed you earlier, uh, you had the artifact looks different as you go deep on the probe. It's going to happen maybe later, and also the shape itself of the artifact is going to look different. Uh, for instance, when you do optotagging, because your LED is right on the top of your new pixels probe. And in the first use case, all you can do is median subtraction. It does a good job. And in most cases, you'll be fine. But in the second case, median subtraction is going to uh, completely screw up your data. And instead of removing the artifact, it's going to generate another one. So what you need to do in this case is compute the average artifact happening across uh, photo simulations and subtract this one that you can scale for individual artifacts from your data and hopefully recover something uh, which looks um, usable. And now I'm going to show you actual examples of such a procedure. So when you start, this is the high pass filter data. That's a color map. Uh, so that's just a voltage, uh, positive or negative in red or, or in blue. You see in blue the negative artifacts corresponding to the onset of the, um, of the opto simulation. In red, you can see the ringing artifacts in both directions caused by the filtering. If I now try to simply median subtract it, this is what I get. Uh, you, you can see that in, in some points, which are closer to what the actual median is like across channels, the artifact is gotten rid of. But in some cases, it becomes a positive artifact. In some cases, it remains negative, sorry. Uh, but then if you add whitening, things get a little bit better. And this is the, kilo, the processing that KiloSort does. But you still have uh, remaining things. So what you need to do is compute the mean artifact, subtract it, and then you it's never perfect because the artifact has some variability across trials, but you can get something slightly better. The, the true, um, uh, in truth, even after doing that, it is safer to uh, like around, like using a window of several microseconds around the onset of your artifact, also blank your data and just not consider um, uh, what's going on in there actively. Uh, that's really the, the way I do it at least. Uh, and there is something else that I want to talk about that I forgot to talk about yesterday. You can see here in the median subtracted plot and also uh, like on every plot essentially, that there seems to be banks of channels which um, are recorded together with um, and which seem to have slightly different timings for the artifact. And this is caused by the fact that you have some banks of channel on the probe which are uh, acquired um, essentially uh, not exactly at the same time. Uh, your sampling rate is 30 kilohertz. You record 30,000 uh, samples per second. But um, under the hood, the multiplexing of the data is such that these banks of channels are not occurred exactly together. They're acquired with a slight delay. And if your artifacts are really, really fast, it's enough for uh, thing, for these artifacts to not be subtractable properly across channels if you don't take the subsampling accuracy into account. Um, and uh, this is an example here from 
um, uh, Bill Carr's documentation. Uh, he wrote uh, some piece of software called Demux Car. Uh, Demux is for demultiplex, I believe, and car is common average referencing. Uh, this handles this, the fact that banks of channels aren't acquired exactly at the same time and subtracts them properly so that compared to regular common average referencing, you do a much better job at subtracting artifacts. So I'm just putting it there. Okay, uh, so now uh, uh, let's talk about the manual curation. So you have preprocessed your data, uh, you run it through kilo sort and phi, and now you're going to uh, wrangle with your data and try to tease apart real from non-real neurons. And here I just want to uh, give some general advice manual curation because I've done a lot of it. Uh, generally speaking, don't trust neurons that you haven't visually inspected, even though it might be tempting to uh, quality metrics are a way to, uh, you know, get, get away with murder. But really, in general, a lot of this can be found by kilo sort and other spec sorting algorithms. So I encourage you to really have a look at your data sets even quickly before uh, using them for your further analysis. Uh, then be aware that that's the only time when you will actually look at your data. Now we're in the age of big data. We're recording, you know, hundreds of neurons at the same time, and it's kind of, you know, depressing when you you have your elders telling you about patching, who are uh, looking at individual spikes one by one, and and really feeling emotionally attached to the new single neurons they're recording. Now we are just, you know, recording banks of data, sort of looking at what, on what's going on on spike GLX, and then we run it through kilo sort and uh, get the good neurons out of it without really looking at them. Spike sorting is when you can compensate for that and still get build an intuition about your data. So really don't undervalue it, even if it's time consuming, do, do spike sorting. And finally, never call a unit good on, on phi unless you are certain that it's good, because usually you will end up spike sorting quite late and your future self is going to be too confident with your past self, and you're not going to question yourself so much. I found myself in situations where I've, I've been respect sorting data sets from two years ago, just because I learned more about um, the structure of the data. And I decided that neurons call, that I called good were actually not that great. So uh, really be careful when, when you label something and don't hesitate to go back to all data sets. And now some specific caveats of curation of data sets with optosimulation. simulation. Sometimes you will see this kind of things on the amplitude view of, of phi. So here that's um, um, the protocol was, what time is it? 30, 23. Uh, the protocol was um, uh, a bunch of trains uh, at 10 Hertz every 10 seconds. And you see that the, the, the time between these blue spikes is exactly 10 seconds. So sometimes you will see these things and you can actually use this view to manually clip away the spikes, which are actually artifacts which are clustered by kilo sort together with a neuron. And you can sometimes um, uh, you know, save some data. Uh, this is what the PSTH of this neuron look like. Of course, that's artifactual. No one would believe it's not. But still, you can uh, wor work your phi and, um, and, and get rid of this. So now let's talk about the last bit of the talk, which is the um, data interpretation, how can you tell that a, that a cell is responsive or not? And to do that, you need to load the data and play with it. And uh, I'm going to tell you about a, a Python package that I wrote called New York Cells at the end, which allows you to, um, to do so. So is my neuron responsive? So the answer here is probably yes, uh, your eyes can uh, tell it, but you want to properly test it. And what you do is you, end, you have your spike times, uh, and um, you uh, want to test whether uh, the, the increasing frame rate of your cell is actually significant. And um, I won't give you a stat course because that's really not the purpose of this talk, but you first need to use a firing rate threshold, of course. You assume that your firing rate is following a Poisson or a normal distribution. You have a predictor and you compute the p-value in every bin, and then you can set a threshold on how many consecutive bins uh, need to um, meet the your p-value threshold. But also importantly, you need probably to use a temporal threshold. Is your neuron responsive responding fast enough? You need to make sure that the increase in frame rate that you see not doesn't happen after several tens of milliseconds because sometimes you have reverberating activity um, in your in your system and uh, the stimulation can leave your brain region and come back and you can have a response after 50 milliseconds sometimes or you can have you know maybe the mouse 
sees the light and reacts behaviorally to it and you have delayed responses to it. So you need to really be careful with the fact that your cells answer quickly enough to the optostimulation. And uh, despite that, there can be ambiguity in the direct responsiveness of your cells to your stimulus. And the way to be extra sure is to then also use a synaptic blocker using gabazine and, and BQX IP5. Um, so this is a, an example where uh, the optostimulus was leading to a massive decrease in failing rate of, of this neuron. And after gabazine, it completely disappears. That's you know, a very um, uh, conceptually simple um, uh, experimental strategy, but that's something you should consider if you really want to make strong statements about the, the cell types that you are recording from. Uh, yeah, so that's about it. Now I'm going to quickly tell you about neuropathic cells, which is a package that uh, I published um, uh, less than a month ago, which uh, is essentially the result of uh, me writing code for myself and then having to pack it nicely for different students that are supervising the lab. Uh, it, over time, it became uh, good enough to be actually used by people. So please um, use it. It's now public on GitHub. You can post issues and nag me if things don't work properly. Uh, they're going to be handling the output of kilo sort and spiking circuits as well, as well as binary files from spike GLX and open fees. And uh, yeah, please, uh, uh, if you want to use it, feel free to. Here are some example use cases. You can load a train using a very simple function, load a cross correlogram. You just need to feed in the path of your data set and your units. And the reason why it's fast is because the first time you compute it, it will actually compute it, but then it's going to save it. Uh, it's going to cache it in memory and reload it really quickly in the future. So it allows your codes to run much, much faster uh, on the long run. You can also load waveforms extract raw chunks of data to do things like artifact subtraction. And interestingly, it also allows you to merge data sets which are acquired on two probes simultaneously. Sometimes, like I, I found that it was a bit of a pain to plot cross correlograms across probes when I was doing multiple neuropixels recordings. And now there's this function which is going to merge data sets together, not the binary files, only the times of the spikes. It's going to model the drift between the clocks of the uh, two probes linearly to be able to um, align them in the same temporal reference frame. And then all the functions from NPIX run on this merged data set just like it does on regular data sets. So it's, it's quite convenient and you can make pretty plots. So, you know, uh, this, this is what I use to, to, to generate the plots that I'm using in my talks. Uh, so yeah, that's about it. Thank you to everyone, uh, to Nick and Matteo for organizing the course, to Marius and Cyril and the team of uh, people developing KiloSort and Phi, to Dimitar, uh, postdoc in the lab who's been supervising my PhD very closely, and Michael, my PI, of, also to Tim Harris who's been driving this, um, like uh, the, the project and the funders and developers, and uh, Michael and Uni who are master students who worked on the optotagging projects uh, back in the days.